Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. And I'm of the opinion that we don't talk about games enough. At least we don't talk about games enough in an intellectual sense, in a sort of the theory of games. What are games? Why do we do them? Clearly, there's a whole bunch of people playing games. I just looked up the numbers online, and we spend over twice as much on video games these days as we do on movies, despite the fact that there's a lot more coverage of movies in uh, TV and magazines. Two-thirds of American households play video games, or at least have someone in there playing video games for more than three hours per week. So video games pervade our lives, as do games more generally, right? Chess, Go, card games, etc. But what is a game? What's the definition of it? And why are we so attracted to them? Why do they fascinate us so? I think that uh, my cats, Ariel and Caliban, in some sense play games. Ariel at least plays fetch. But we human beings go to great lengths to invent completely arbitrary rules, play by them, and then invest enormous amounts of emotion into whether we win or lose or how we do playing this game. So today we have on one of the world's leading people who does think about these issues in detail. Frank Lance is a very active game designer. He's designed a number of video games, uh, Gearheads, Drop7, which is a famous iPhone, mobile phone game, CSI, Crime City, as well as various real world games where people are out there in the streets actually playing by certain rules. But he's also the director of the Game Center at NYU. So his part of his job is to take the bigger picture, to really ask what games are, where they're going. So this is a very fun conversation. Uh, I do have to admit that it was in an extremely unusual setting that we had the conversation. This was a live recording at the Santa Fe Institute's Interplanetary Festival in Santa Fe, which is a very fun event. But to be honest, the recording was in a big space, in a big tent with lots of other things going on. So the amount of background noise is considerable. And what's worse, I wasn't using my own equipment. I was using uh, the, the local equipment there. And the good news is that Frank's microphone was really good. So you'll hear him well. My microphone, sadly, was not as good. And also I was, because of that, trying to project. So it sounds like I'm shouting the entire time for the entire podcast. But, you know, I've, I've done what I can to uh, save the audio file, make it as listenable as possible. And like I said, Frank, who's the one you're there to listen to, is actually very clear in this recording. So I think it's such a good conversation on the substantive level that it's well worth listening to. So let's go. Frank Lance, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Thanks. Great to be here. So uh, I, I don't want to put into words what it is you do, although I've already done that in the intro, but you both design games and have this sort of academic position. So why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, what, is, what are the games that you've been responsible for? Well, uh, yeah, I'm a game designer. I've been making games for a long time uh, and also teach game design at NYU. Uh, so do both of these simultaneously. Um, the game design department is in the Tisch School of the Arts, okay. which is the same school that has the film school and acting and things like that. And uh, the idea is that uh, the instructors there are also practitioners. So, you know, we uh, are professional game developers and people who uh, have an ongoing career and a practice. And so that's what I've been doing for, for many years now. And uh, uh, as a game designer in New York, I made a lot of weird kind of experimental games. I had a small studio called Area Code. Uh, we specialized in location-aware games and street games, games that took place in physical spaces that incorporated computers but weren't on computers. So uh, they weren't video games in the traditional sense. Yeah. Instead, we were sort of taking advantage of the emerging kind of ubiquitous computing technology to create new kinds of game experiences that brought back social interaction uh, in, into the mix. Um, so I did a lot of games like that. Uh, I taught a class in, in that style of game at ah. NYU, and the students in that class made a game called Pac-Man Hatton, uh, which was uh, <laughs> translating the game of Pac-Man onto the grid, onto the uh, street grid of, of uh, New York City. Um, cool. So that's the kind of thing that uh, that we did. Um, my studio did a bunch of games. We made a bunch of uh, large-scale social games for Facebook. 
Uh, we also did a game called Drop 7, which you may be An familiar with. An old favorite of mine. Okay, okay. I spent many hours playing Drop 7 on the iPhone. Nice, nice. And uh, yeah, so I've, I've made lots and lots of games over the years. And then recently, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I um, made a game called Universal Paperclips, right. which was uh, the sort of first time that I had sat down to program a game, a game myself uh, from, from scratch. And... Uh, so that was a fun experience, and that's the the most recent thing I've. They can take over your life programming something like that. It, yeah, it was it was deeply satisfying and <laughs> and, uh, and and a learning experience. And, and I should mention I'm I'm very new at this in the sense that this is the first ever time that Mindscape has done a live podcast. So for those of you <laughs> listening over the podcast radio internet network, uh, we are here live at the Santa Fe Interplanetary Festival. It will also explain why you may hear noises in the background, like. What I think was a theremin was just going on, but it may very well have been an alien creature talking its special language, because we're here at the Interplanetary Festival, anything can happen. So that's okay. We're all about experiences and new ones and seeing how things go. So one of the wonderful things I like, Frank, about your work is that you, you have designed games, you've programmed games, you've coded, but you also think carefully about the bigger picture, which is my favorite thing and our favorite thing here on Mindscape. So let's just be as big as we can. What, what is a game? What, what qualifies some activity as being a game rather than being something else? Well, I think of game as a cultural category. So it doesn't have a very precise definition that will allow you to distinguish between things that are games and aren't games in some kind of uh, automatic way uh, by looking at their internal characteristics and identifying them. Uh, instead, it, it is, uh, you know, it represents a kind of a broad category of, of human action. Uh, and uh, I think of it as being a, a, a creative form uh, and something like an art form, an aesthetic form. So something like literature or music or film, dance, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and so it's going to have all the same kind of ambiguity to uh, precisely identify what is or isn't a game, but to me, it is it is the art form of interactivity. It, it is the uh, it is the creative form of uh, of, of ex designing experiences uh, for people. You're still trying to create something meaningful, uh, beautiful, interesting, popular, uh, expressive, um, but you're doing it by crafting people's uh, interactions by, by crafting their, their choices and, and their actions. So I like that. The art form of interactivity. So the um, I, I apologize to the audience. Like I, 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 There's an audience in front of me, so I feel I should project my voice to them. But the podcast listeners will be like, why is he shouting on the podcast? He doesn't do that. Sorry. Take it into consideration. But interactivity then clearly, so that's the thing. Like it doesn't matter that there's a goal, it doesn't matter that you can win or lose, it doesn't matter that there are other people, it's that there's a matter that you're not just looking at the work of art, you are interacting with it. That's what makes it a game. Yeah, and I think things like having a goal, uh, win state and lost state, those are the kinds of things that lots of games do have. So, you know, when we're looking to identify whether something's a game or not, having those qualities make it more likely that it's a game. In, in the same sense that um, music is, is about sound, uh, but, you know, in some cases, music might be about silence, right? So the absence of sound doesn't mean that it's not a piece of music. Sure. This famous John Cage piece, you know. <laughs> um, it just is like, these are the kinds of things by which we, it's like a family resemblance thing. You know, Wittgenstein famously sort of used game, the word game is an example of how hard it is to define anything. Yeah. Um, because, you know, but, but yeah, there's these family resemblances. You, they do tend to be about goals, um, but not always. And, and not recently, always. Uh, game designers have really been exploring the space of games that are explicitly not about goals. So that, that's, uh, that's... You know, I went through a phase when I was uh, quasi-active in Second Life. I don't oh. know if you ever did Second Life. I, no, I didn't myself, but I'm familiar with it. Yeah. Well, I, I, I got into it because there was a podcast that was in Second Life. So there was an interviewer and, and so forth. Jennifer, my wife, hosted, um, was one of the many hosts of this podcast. And I, I gave public lectures in Second Life. My impression was always, for those of you who don't know, it's a massively online game in some sense. But they never, so you had an avatar. There was a world. You built a virtual world. There weren't goals though. It was an open world in the broadest sense. It was like, here it is. Here's your play box. Here's your sandbox. Go play with it. 
And I think it kind of faltered because of that. There, there's other virtual worlds like World of, War, of Warcraft, other games that are much more popular because you can still build the world, but there's also a way to win or lose yeah. from moment to moment. I actually, I'm fascinated by Second Life. I think it's more interesting now in its moribund state as this like abandoned virtual world. world. Yeah, yeah that, that you see people like take tours of it, like they're going to Chernobyl, you know. And there's just these big, strange, uh, decaying ruins of corporate sponsored like avant-garde yeah. art locations <laughs> it's very weird and cool yeah. well it was weird to me because because it's second life it, it tried to mimic life like you could have a house we had a house we had a cat in our house yeah um but then you could apparently just walk into other people's house and rifle around and that was weird and you didn't know whether that was okay or not yeah I, I mean, I always thought the, the the sort of fascination with virtual worlds was a, it happened in like the nineties and early two thousands. Yeah. It was a little bit misplaced, you know. The idea for me as a game designer, what was interesting about World of Warcraft was not that it was a virtual world that happened to be a game. It was that it was a game that incorporated a virtual world, right? And the fact that it was a game, I thought, was a really important part of that experience, right? Because uh, a game like a virtual world has the implication that this is just another type of social space. Uh, but but a game is a kind of um, theatrical. It's, it's kind of like uh, expressive. Like we know we're entering into a kind of performance. Performative. And yeah. yeah, and so it's important in World of Warcraft that it isn't just things like, you know, race and politics. It's this strange representation of race and politics. You know, and, and I was a, a horde. Uh, I was I was okay. a I was a troll in World of Warcraft, and of course there was a horde versus alliance, and um, it was this you know big kind of underlying motivation for for your play, and you know I hated the alliance, of course, um, but it, but it guys. was it wasn't real hate, right? It's not real hate taking place in a in a virtual space. It was the it was this strange kind of performative hate, uh, which is similar to you know what you get when you. Uh, are performing a play or, or looking at a painting or reading a poem. You know what I mean? I think that's the important thing. But it can also bleed over into the real world. I mean, fans of one sports team can be very not friendly with fans of another sports team. It's true. And I think when you get violence in sports fandom is where you see a failure of the, of the kind of ritual transformative aspect. I think when it's working, um, sports fandom gives you this kind of... Uh, strange uh, toy version of the kind of uh, totalitarian identity that we get when we just feel like, oh, I'm disappearing into the mob. I become a, a Mets fan or I become a Yankees fan. And, and I get to experience the pleasure of what it's, you know, what it feels like to get rid of my actual identity, all the nuance and subtlety of, of being a person and being part of all kinds of different communities. And instead, I get to plunge into this simplistic, atavistic, you know, thing. And that's kind of be beautiful because it's not real. You could be a member of a tribe without all of the terrible baggage that can sometimes yeah, go along yeah. with that. In and, real and, it, and it works because we know in this, even when we commit fully to it, uh, it, it is bracketed in a way. And that, that to me is, is part of what makes, you know, sports and, and games in general, um, feel like they belong alongside the arts. Well, one of the things I noticed in Second Life with, with the, this podcast that Jennifer was a host of was, so she would interview people, like you interview people in a podcast, she would invite them on, and they generally wouldn't have Second Life characters already, so they would design them from scratch. And you saw there were only two types. There were like the people who designed the most sexually attractive version of themselves, right? Yes. Like buff and beautiful and, and glamorous clothes. Right. Or people who went completely crazy. They were a unicorn or they were a flock of butterflies. And, mm -hmm. and that freedom to be something completely different was very valuable to them. Yeah. But it's still, they're, they're still expressing something that was inside their real selves. Yeah, and I think, I, I think you see that in role-playing games as well. When people design avatars for themselves in, in you know, Morrowind or, or you know, uh, any kind of uh, RPG uh, they're they're you know kind of playing with identity in that same way, and it brings me brings us back. I should have asked this even before. What is a game? What is playing? Like cats and dogs play, right? It's not purely mm -hmm. human. I actually have a cat who plays fetch. She's like a little sure. puppy. She'll yeah. bring it back, and and her brother won't do that. But so somewhere along evolutionary evolutionary time, 
our presumably we like like everything else in evolution we developed some mental machinery for some reason and we repurposed it for another reason yeah so the hunting and the gathering or whatever got repurposed as play do we know a lot about the evolution of play and what purposes it serves yeah i mean i think there's a deep scholarship uh about play that comes out of anthropology and also sociology and psychology and development science and uh and I think one of the things that's fascinating about games is that it, you know, it taps into this, this deep and ancient form of behavior, which is not only there at the beginning of, of human culture, but really predates human culture. Right. Um, there's a, the, the sociologist uh, Huizinga, who wrote this famous book called Homo Ludens, uh, which is about how play really is the origin point of human culture, like really? human, yeah, human culture and civilization comes out of play. This sounds and the like play one of many grandiose claims that you could either believe or disbelieve equally well. Yeah, it is, it is but we like Huizinga, so we're going to give him, <laughs> okay. uh, we're going to give him the nod in this case. But, um, but yeah, I mean, so as for what it is, um, I think it has something to do with the power of uh, free exploration. Uh, a lot of what we do is is kind of bound and guided by by our goals and our and our, our rules of, of interaction. And then some things we do are more exploratory. They're more improvisational. They are uh, they're more unbounded. Um, they involve uh, things that are maybe random or you know trial and error. Um, and and you know we're we're, we're if I pick up this bottle, um, I know what I'm supposed to do, uh, which is hold it up to my lips and drink it. But if I just pour some out on the table, oh my god, you, know, you did it! That, that's that's playful, right? Because like, I'm 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 exploring the, the the range of possible actions I can take with this with this bottle, um, and it, it it's not just the ones that we think of right. uh, immediately because we're kind of programmed to to behave in certain programmed ways. It's all the different ways I all the different things I can do with this bottle, right? So that's that's play. And I think that's one half of, of games. I think what's um, super interesting is that in games, you get this idea of play, wild improvisation, kind of unbounded, uh, energetic, imp, you know, excess and imaginative kind of uh, exploration. And it's, it's also, it's in conversation with the opposite, with structure, with structure, rules, yeah. with, uh, with goals, with arbitrary goals. Like, oh, I'm going to, um, you know, tie one hand behind my back and now what, what can I do with this bottle? Like, just like, like, uh, and, and so these two things are kind of a, in conversation in games, right? Play and, and rules, kind of freedom and structure. Rules seem to be one of the things that goes almost inevitably along with the concept of games, right? And, and like you say, we make them up. It's, it's always been psychologically fascinating to me that we invent rules and then we stick to them. Like we invented them, like, and, yeah. or the goal, like, okay, create, you know, win your golden prize for playing the game a certain number of times on your iPhone this week. But then they become very important to us, despite the fact that we know they're entirely arbitrary. Yeah. And in games, we get to play with rules and we get to submit ourselves to them. We get to experience the pleasure of being bound by a little arbitrary system. And there is a particular kind of pleasure there. Uh, but then we also are given a chance to, to, to recognize how rules are constructed. Like as a game designer, my job is to make rules, and uh, and and as as a player, we we encounter a game, we we voluntarily step into it, submit ourselves to the rules, but then we then we finish, we we stop playing, and we step back, and we realize, oh well, that's the characteristics of this little set of rules, but it could have been a different way, and even as a player, you get to play with the rules. You say, what what if we do it again, but this time. Um, let's tie both hands behind our back or this time, you know, let's, let's, uh, not try to do this thing. Let's try to do this other thing. Right. And, and so it gives you a sense of how rules are pliable. And if I'm playing solitaire, let's say I'm playing with real cards, not just on a phone. And if I lose, if I can't, you know, finish the deck, I feel bad. <laughs> I'm tempted to cheat. Like, why is that? Well, because I think part of what you get from a game is this little sense that you're being tested and that it's a little puzzle. Solitaire is like a little puzzle. And when you do well at solitaire, it's partly a reflection 
of the fact that you're smart. And so when you do poorly... <laughs> so it's your self-image. Yeah. It you, it's, so it's almost like wanting to take your temperature again to see if maybe you could get hotter. You know, <laughs> you gave this wonderful talk uh, for the audience out there. You should look online for a talk that Frank gave that involves two games that he compares and contrasts, Go and Poker. And let's, let's take them in order because they're both fascinating for their own reasons. Go, of course, uh, it's Japanese originally. Is that right? Uh, Chinese originally. Chinese yeah. originally. Okay. Um, it's the... It's to Asian cultures what chess is, to Western cultures. And it's very formal and rigid, and the rules are very clear, and people get into it. And you make this wonderful analogy that it becomes like a martial art in mm -hmm. some sense. It's a form of discipline to become yeah. a good Go player. Yeah. Um, Go is an example of the kind of game that is a very hard, deep, cognitive problem. Uh, like the kind that scientists wrestle with, but totally separate from the the idea in science that that you're working on a problem for a particular reason because it fits into some larger framework because by solving this problem you'll be able to solve this other problem or because it might lead downstream to some engineering breakthroughs in the case of go you are just wrestling with that problem for its own sake you invented it yeah yeah and and uh and it's it's a very deep and beautiful game and it's been around for thousands of years and it's another great example of how strange games are as an art form because we have i mean there are not that many uh works of literature uh or music that people have been interacting with for thousands of years and they're still doing it in the same way they're still getting a similar kind of value out of it they're still uh, thinking about it and participating with it in in a similar way, um, yeah. And it's yeah, it's 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 a remarkable game. We'd be and, remiss if we didn't mention the computers are now better than humans. Yes, it's also it's it's this great example of how games are often the sort of ultimate test bed for artificial intelligence. And Go is this iconic kind of quintessential AI problem, which just recently um, tumbled and maybe yeah. is the sort of last. Uh, sort of the last game, the last kind of fully, you know, full-fledged human game that humans are, are really good at. Um, well, we'll get to poker in a second. Yeah. And, but yeah. It, it took longer for computers to win at Go against the best Go players than at chess. It did. Right? And, and people, I think, a little bit um, overinterpreted that. They were like, oh, well, chess, of course... Of course, computers are going to be good at chess because look at it. You can see that it's it's combinatorial and you can just crunch, you know, through and look at all the possibilities. But Go, Go requires intuition and deep <laughs> insight and all these kind really? of ineffable. I think there was a, yeah. a sense of that, it, maybe especially among game designers, uh, for whom one of the beauties of Go is that it does require intuition. And, and it, there is an ineffable quality. Like you, you talk about things like shape. And these kind of nebulous concepts, like it's not just sitting down and crunching through. If I go there, you go there, I go there, you go there. You actually do have these hard to pin down concepts. And so I think people thought, oh, well, this will be our bulwark against AI and it'll last for a long time. But of course, it didn't. It didn't last well, that long. So for those who have never seen it, how big is the go board? 19 by 19. So it's 19 by 19 grid and you put either white or black. Pebbles yeah, down, you can alternate stones. black and white stones. So, I mean, part of me wants to say, I'll, I'll be a scientist here for a second. It's a finite game. There's only a finite number of things that can happen. Sure. But the other part says, but that number is really, really big. So, big. of course, when real human beings play Go, just like playing chess, we don't, in our brains, try to go through every combinatorial possibility. We use heuristics. We use our intuition. We look at the shape of the board. We get a feeling. You talk about the energy that comes off of different configurations of the pieces. Yeah. And, of course, then you ask the computer to do it. It was... I heard a talk here at Santa Fe Institute, in fact, uh, by a former professional Go player who, like many professional Go players, gave up when the computer won mm. because they can't compete now with the computer. But what we, one of the things we learned was one of the things that was holding the artificial intelligence back from becoming a really good Go player was that they trained it on human games first. And it actually turned out to be much better if they just let it play against itself yeah. without ever poisoning it with human yeah. intuition. That was the real headline with AlphaGo, is that it, it got so much better when we stopped trying to um, seed it with the, the centuries of knowledge that humans had developed. With all of our insights, all of our heuristic, all of our, all of our ways of teaching Go, we just left that out. And instead, we gave it the rules, and then we gave it a technique for playing against itself. And a preference for winning. And it did so much better. It was really 
it, kind yeah. of an interesting lesson there about uh, about humility. And some of the players used words like it was playing against an alien because the computer used concepts that the humans hadn't thought of before. But it was still beautiful. Like right. the thing is that the the Go experts who were watching AlphaGo still found the moves that AlphaGo made that were surprising to be exquisite. And so that was exciting to there me. There is a beauty there. Absolutely. Yeah, that, yeah, and it's a beauty that is, on one hand, non-human or inhuman because it, it surprised us and came out of... And on the other hand, deeply human because it is Go itself expressing itself. Like it is... And, and, and an, a project like AlphaGo is the, the result of, of hundreds of people, thousands of people collaborating and working together and building on each other's insights and knowledge to make this piece of engineering so in some sense it's deeply human yeah and i think that's a that's a nice thing it was humans who had the motivation to invent the game right yeah. if the computer never got to play another game it wouldn't get frustrated yeah <laughs> yeah we, that's what comes from us human beings yeah and that's why i like this this idea of using games like go almost as a tool of self-discipline right as a yeah. way it's almost like a meditative monk-like or martial art-like practice of yeah. training ourselves to be a slightly better people than we are. Yes, it's it, the way I like to think about about it is that it is it's a way of thinking about thinking. Go itself is a way of thinking about thinking. And artificial intelligence is also a way of thinking about thinking. And when people play Go, I think this is true for for as long as people have played Go, they've been doing a kind of artificial intelligence <laughs> research. Okay. You know what I mean? Because they've been Well, but they've been thinking What's possible if I take this little isolated problem and devote all of my thinking, in fact, devote my entire life, like a serious Go player, like a, like a serious player of any, you know, like truly deep competitive game, gives up the rest of their life right. to explore this thing. And if and that to, were World of Warcraft, we would say it's terrible, but exactly. if it's Go, we think it's beautiful. Yeah. And, and, chess. And, and so in the case of a game like Go, which is about decision making, what they're doing is saying, I'm going to sacrifice my life uh, in order to explore in the deepest possible way. What it, what it means to solve problems, to, to, what it means to apply every fiber of my cognitive ability to solving a very precise and specific kind of problem and to, and to go deep and to like watch it unfold. And it turns out it's fascinating and beautiful. It's not trivial, even though it's, a, it's an extraordinarily simple game with only a, a handful of rules. Well, maybe this is the good place to mention the idea that if you just say games, especially in our modern culture where that has slightly the connotation of video games, um, people worry it has a slightly disreputable connotation, right? Like this is something the kids do, it's distracting them from more important things. If you had said chess or go, maybe they would, sit, they would get the fact that that's a more elevated, uh, sublime thing. Yeah. But is it really different or all games have an aspect of this? Um, I think people are right to be suspicious of games. Uh, I'm a game designer. I've devoted my life to making games and playing games, and I love them very deeply. Um, but games, by their very nature, have to live outside of ordinary life. And we should be suspicious of them. <laughs> like, I think art is the same way, right? People are also suspicious of art. You spend all your time, like, you know, reading these, these stupid books, you know, uh, and, and just, you know, re reading comic books or, or, um, you you're obsessed with with uh, music and you you know you're like hanging out with your friends playing that noise instead of you know doing something practical and useful yeah um so i i think in that sense uh yeah games occupy this weird space outside of our kind of ordinary system of values and they should that's their job is to be out there doing weird stuff and uh, and and exploring the the you know the edges of of what we what we know and, and think and, and imagine I mean, so it's my part of my job as the podcast host is to be slightly contrary and play the devil's advocate a little bit here. So okay. some go or chess uh, might be very beautiful. Even World of Warcraft can be beautiful in its own way. There are some games that are really, really simple. And yet it is hard to ascribe that same level of beauty to them. And yet they really get us. They get their hooks into us yes. and they become addictive. Right? Yes. There's a whole there's one of the gaming companies called Addicting Games. That's what yeah. they shoot for. Maybe Tetris was the first very well-known yeah. one on the computer, but this is, you know, this is definitely a goal of certain game designers to make a very simple game that will prevent people from ever putting their phone down. And I, and I think we could just, we can look at slot machines as a case in point of this, right? Slot machines 
are games, I would, I would say. And uh, there, are, there is a very dark energy <laughs> to, to slot machines. Slot machines um, ruin people's lives. Not everyone. I mean, there's some people who have a healthy relationship to slot machines and they actually get some meaning and, and, and yep. pleasure and, and, and joy and, and, and beauty out of slot machines. And, um, but, you Which know, ma- literally no skill, by the way, right? You're essentially um, pushing a button or pulling a... Yes. Yeah, that's you know, the, 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 the kind of... Uh, yeah, the, the quintessential version of a slot machine is no skill. Uh, a, you you can't be an advantage gamer who finds slot machines and like exploits sure. uh, certain payoffs and use your intelligence to actually get a little bit of an edge. But let's just say in the case, uh, you know, in the, in the classic case, a slot machine is just pure randomness. I love the fact that um, there are slot machine tournaments. There are. I mean, yeah, you can, there are people who make a living playing slot machines. It's like, but anyway, um, the thing is, so, so slot machines do have a kind of dark energy. And we are right to be... Uh, anxious about that and and uh and and i think good game designers know um that that they have a kind of aversion to that type of game they recognize that they could do that you can put that into your game um but but most good game designers want to make a game that is more than just compelling uh it does more than just cause the player to want to keep doing it if they want to make the kind of game that they themselves love the kind of game that after you played it, you're happy that you did. And you look back and you say, oh, that added something of value to my life. Not, oh, God, I'm sick to my stomach because I've just wasted my, my time and energy and money. Um, and, and, but it's, it's never that simple, right? Because sometimes yeah. great games can have a little bit of dark energy in them. Just like great art can have a little bit of dark energy, a little self-destructive energy, right? And so we don't want to, we want to be careful not to be too dogmatic, uh, and, and to say, oh, well, we can apply this moral filter to games and understand what's good and bad about them. Because the role of games, like the role of art, is not just to be good or bad, but to explore what being good or bad means, right? And you can't do that if you start from a, a starting point where you're like, well, I know what bad is. Bads are, slot machines are bad. That's what addiction is bad, right? Yeah. No. So part of what a game, like my game Drop 7, I hope, which I, which I think is kind of addictive has addictive elements what i hope i really hope (laughs) is that it's not just addictive but it is in a sense about addiction like it gives people a kind of a toy version of a thing that is a little bit like heroin but also a little (laughs) bit like sudoku Uh and and a a little bit like like tetris um and a little bit like a painting or a little bit like a rug or a little bit like weaving Um, and it takes all of these things and combines them in a way that i hope gives people some insight and perspective into how their mind works and why why they enjoy it and not not just a kind of like a, a black box that they disappear into does that, does that make sense it makes a lot yeah. of sense but i want to say parenthetically for the cosmology aficionados in the audience that this is a different sense of the word dark energy than we oh. use in cosmology or is it or is it? <laughs> yes, it is. It definitely is. Okay. But do we know anything about the neuroscience of what makes it addicting? Is there is are there some we, games that just poke your dopamine receptor? We do. Uh, you know, the psychologists know a lot about uh, sort of reward schedules. Um, and uh, in the case of slot machines, for example, what makes them so powerfully compulsive is that the rewards are intermittent. Yes. That we, uh, yeah, we're not able to predict them. And so these famous experiments where rats, they push a button and they always get a pellet. They'll do that until they've had their fill. But if they push a button and occasionally get a pellet, they'll do that until they die. unpredictable. Yeah, they'll do that. So, um, and so this kind of intermittent reward schedule is a big part of what makes something uh, truly compulsive. But I, I tend to be a little bit skeptical of that. Like sometimes I will get calls from journalists and they'll be like, tell me how these evil corporations making these addictive mobile games are using these psychological principles. And, um, and I have no doubt that these big companies do employ psychologists, but I actually don't think it's that easy. Um, and because I think if it, if it were, everyone would do it. Yeah. Right. Um, there, I think even in the case of slot machines, if you talk to people who design slot machines, they don't always know what, what is going to be popular. <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll try a bunch of different kinds of slot machines and it turns out, oh, this Golden Girls machine is doing amazingly well. Or this Batman machine is, is, a, you have to be is a turd. You know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah, exactly. So there's still this sense of trial and error. And in some sense, it's still a kind of a creative process. Um, and I think for me, in, in terms of games, the important thing to remember is 
games are culture. Games are not primarily technology. Games are a form of culture that has this deep relationship to technology, but they are not simply technology. They're not simply devices. Uh, they're not things that you plug in and then you get a hedonic, you know, pulse and that they, they're like a coffee machine, you know. Instead, they are more like hats. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> why did everyone wear hats for a while? Uh, yeah. Why did every single man in every social space wear this same hat? For a while, that was all people away. did, right? Yeah. Is it is that addiction? You know, it's it's weird. Like, so I think games, uh, even addictive games, have that weird element in them, which makes them hard to just. Uh, you can't just plug in a formula and guarantee that you'll have something popular or uh, compulsive or successful. It's never happened to me, but has it maybe happened to you that you've been playing a game so much that you fell asleep and while you were dreaming, you kept playing the game? Yes. In <laughs> fact, I'll tell you, uh, the game that did that to me in in the most powerful way uh, was a game by David O'Reilly called Everything. Okay. It's a beautiful game. If you've never played it, I really recommend it. You can play it on the PlayStation. And, and um, it, it's an exploration of the the thinking of Alan Watts, the great oh, okay. Zen yeah. uh, philosopher. And David, who's this brilliant genius, um, made the game in such a way that if you stop controlling it for a while, it sort of automatically starts playing itself. <laughs> and, and so if you just put it, the controller down, after a while, it'll slowly start to just kind of randomly do actions and move through the space and explore it. And I was playing it very late one night. I was very tired and... And I was, I was already kind of in this loopy kind of state of mind. And I'm listening to the voice of Alan Watts, you know, talk about <laughs> transcendence and, and mindfulness. And, um, and I was drifting out of consciousness. And then occasionally I would wake up and the, and the game would be playing. And I wasn't even sure whether, whether it was, <laughs> was me it or not. Or game, yeah, yes. it was a really beautiful experience. Wow. Yeah, I think there's a lot to learn that we don't yet know about the psychology of this. My personal theory about Tetris and even Drop 7 and these other games were that there's some threshold where every time you lost, you felt, well, if I had done one little thing better, I, I would have won. So therefore, yeah. I should play again. I think that's the mark of a good game in many cases. Yeah. Uh, in many cases, what, we, what we're trying to do as designers is create just that experience where um, I, I lost, I, and, but there was meaning to my life. Like, I understand now what I should have done differently. And so what the player is doing is building up a little model. Uh, of the system that you designed and uh and and they're doing they have hypotheses and then they they do little experiments and i think there's a lot of kind of like toy science in, oh, in a lot of games and and so yeah. yeah this this feeling of uh the player kind of uh wanting to understand what you've made and going deeper and deeper so that feeling of like oh i know what i want to try differently this time oh i love it i also love it in a game where i get this feeling that ooh something here is broken i bet i can exploit ah i bet there's a thing here that the, the designer edge. has not thought of <laughs> and so i'm going to use you know like an axe and i'm not going to wear any armor and i bet i'm going to get this weird and and so that feeling of something being almost broken or the potential of it being broken to me that's catnip well it goes back to you know yourself image right you're you're yes. playing a game to get reaffirmation that I, i'm pretty clever here i am pretty clever <laughs> <laughs> speaking of being pretty clever let, let's switch from go we got off go okay. a little bit but this idea of a sublime martial art that we use mm -hmm. to train ourselves to poker which is actually one of my favorite games oh. and you uh you wonderfully contrast this idea of sitting in the tranquil zen garden and playing you know very slowly and deliberately and engaging your most rational mind to the degenerate gamblers that we get in the poker yeah. community in Vegas. Yeah, it's it's uh, these, these are the, the two games that I played most, you know, uh, deeply in, in my life uh, in some ways are very similar. But yeah, they have this because because Go is sort of like the beloved of game design snobs. And it has this it's this ancient game with it's kind of like a sacred ritual. And there's a lot of respect and, and a kind of a deep culture. And, and then poker, of course, is the game you play when you're crouched down next to the slot machines <laughs> and, you know, they've set up you a little table and yeah, you're listening background. to the chime of the slot machines and they're bringing you free drinks and, and you're not even sure whether, you know, you're good or not because you think you're cleverly exploiting some edge that you have, but maybe you're not, maybe you're, you just suck and you don't even know. Right. So it puts you in this totally opposite frame of mind. Um, One of the most fascinating <laughs> things about poker for me is that, it is clearly advantageous for you if your fellow players think you're an idiot 
because you can exploit that. Yeah. But there's such an enormous psychological desire for your fellow players to think you're brilliant. Yes. That you resist taking yes. advantage of that. Yeah. And and it's such a beautiful game because <laughs> it, it involves all of the kind of uh, problem solving, that cognitive problem solving that goes into Go. Right. There's still lots of math in, in poker, lots of ways to apply yourself and develop a kind of you know, serious scholarly discipline to really plumbing the depths of how this thing works as a system. And at the same time, it's deeply social. It's so much about uh, tapping into to, uh, your, your ego and the ego of other people. Also, how we predict uh, each other, right? Uh, the models that we have for each other's behavior. It's the this most kind crucial of, thing, having yeah. a model of what your opponents are going to do and yes. then manipulating that model by talking to them, by not talking, right. by hiding. But, but it involves a kind of empathy. Like we, it, you can't be good at poker unless you can put yourself into the shoes of your opponent and think, oh, what are they thinking? Um, and then they're doing the same thing to you. So you get this strange reciprocal quality. What are they thinking I'm thinking? And, uh, and, and it's just, it's mind blowing, which is, is one of the things that led John von Neumann to invent game theory. Right. But he looked at poker. One he, of the smartest people of the 20th century. Yeah. And, and, and he was like, oh, he compared poker to go, uh, I'm sorry, poker to, go to chess. And he was like, well, chess is not really a game. Chess is obviously just a math problem. Yeah. We just now, haven't solved it yet. Poker. Now that's a game because if, because it involves this, um, conflict between people where it's all about what I think you think I think, right? It's this deeply convoluted back and forth of, of, uh, of modeling each other. And that's what, you know, he wanted to understand. And, and yet, uh, Jim McManus, who's a writer who wrote a wonderful book about mm. poker, uh, point out that at least for a long time, every poker book had six shooters on the cover of the mm. book. Even though they have nothing to do with playing poker, there's this image of outlaw, of degeneracy, of living on the edge that is the opposite of the image that we have in Chess or Go. But I do love the, the, the mythic figure of the gambler. Uh, and it's to me, it's always been a it's romantic thing. Yeah. It really is a romantic ideal uh, because I think what the gambler represents... The aliens are landing here somewhere nearby, yeah. but we're going to press on. What the mythic <laughs> archetype of the gambler represents is the person who has trained themselves or by their very personality has a taste for variance, a taste for risk. If you're willing to eat risk, you can profit from it. And, and there's something powerful and strange about that because I think uh, randomness, risk, probability, these are things that as humans, we're still trying to wrap our heads around. We still don't quite understand how to think about them. We're Even terrible, in, in physics, yeah. right, um, there's this like deep debate uh, about how to interpret randomness, like, or philosophy, like we don't whether have it exists. Of probability. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and here we have in in poker an art form devoted to it, which uh, in its own way is is about getting at some of the same questions uh, about how does the world work? Is and, is, the, is the everything idea, deterministic or not? Yeah, you know? but the the idea of expectation and the idea of not being results oriented is is one that I love in Go or in chess. There's a right or wrong move in every circumstance, even if you don't know what it is. Yeah. But in poker, you might make the best possible move and still lose. Yes. And which is what makes it so incredibly <laughs> maddening, right? You can, you can work so hard and you can be sitting at a table of people who are only there to party. And they've never yeah. once thought about how to play or what the right move is. And you can be playing at such a high level and they can just be making the donkiest moves ever and they can take all of your money yeah, and they can, can do it over and over and over again and it's just soul crushing but but that's what makes it to my to my mind beautiful because you have to overcome that kind of soul crushing quality yeah and and then that's the sense in which poker can be a spiritual discipline just like go was you know uh we should give some yeah. practical advice to the audience you know if you want to make money playing poker Vegas, 2 a.m. when you've not been drinking is the best time to play because there'll yeah. be plenty of people who are there just to have a good time. Yes. <laughs> if you want to make money at poker, uh, come play me tonight. Uh, Sean and I are <laughs> going to have a game and we're just terrible. So. <laughs> and, and, but it is, it's a, it's a different kind of game because it's, it's in some sense more realistic than Go. It, it hasn't been abstracted down to this pristine set of situations. It's a game of incomplete information. We don't know what's going to happen. Right. And that's some of the fun. And I also think it's a harder AI problem for the for that reason. Empirically, too. it is. Yeah. yeah. Be because it, it does involve this kind of reciprocal modeling and guessing. And and it's 
it's the same kind of AI problem if all you're trying to do is develop a cast iron strategy that is not exploitable. In other words, if all you want to do is develop a strategy that no one else can have a strategy that will get money from it, right? On average, you can yeah. tie it works. Yeah. yeah, a perfect strategy in that sense. That's just a, a trivial, I mean, it's not, it's a hard problem, but in some sense, it's, it's a knowable problem. We understand how to solve that kind of problem. And it's, um, but if the problem you're trying to, to solve is how can I make a strategy that is flexible enough to adapt to the poor play of my opponents in a way to maximize the edge I have against other players who are not playing perfectly, uh, then you have a higher level problem because then you have all of the psychology of interpreting people, understanding what their strategy is from their actions, and they might be doing it to you at the same time. If Go is human, then poker is even more so for exactly these Yeah, reasons. yeah, poker is superhuman. And you have this wonderful quote from Phil Ivey, who is arguably the best poker player in the world right now. I just saw it last night, so I don't know if you remember the quote yeah. or I should give it. You give it and I'll, I'll tell you. Roughly speaking, yeah. Phil Ivey, you know, just chit-chatting with other poker players in the middle of a game said, you know when you lose so much money that you can't breathe? I love that. <laughs> yeah, he said, that's what I'm addicted to. That's what I'm addicted to. And it was to, beautiful right? because this was, I think, um, in, in Poker After Dark, one of these other great TV shows. And so he wasn't even aware that necessarily, it was, it was kind of like in the background, in the chatter. And, uh, and it was very honest. And I, as soon as I heard that, I got chills. This idea that that's that weird feeling of being sick to your stomach that pain like that is the thing that he was addicted to i was like i recognize that and yeah. and again there's there is a darkness there uh that that there's a kind of destructive energy that's not a good thing i'm not i'm not here to tell you oh this is all sweetness <laughs> and light and poker is wonderful and you know like no this is it's it's horrifying and 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 it is destructive right i mean um uh, but it also can be kind of deeply meaningful and deeply beautiful. So that's well, that's what I'm addicted to. But it's also <laughs> a central part of gaming. It's not just poker where you lose a lot of money. But even if you're a spectator, we just finished the NHL and NBA playoffs, right? Yes. Most teams end their season on a losing note. Most fans are disappointed at the end of the season because they didn't win the championship. There's that that sense of loss being not, not maybe not inevitable, but at least likely is a big part of what brings us to these games. Yes. Unless, like me, you are the North. In which case, I was very happy. Oh, uh, okay. Well, yes. there you go. Well, yeah. But you didn't know that ahead of time, no, right? I didn't. Like, I, as a Philadelphian, I would say that you kind of got lucky that Joel Embiid was sick during the, during the playoffs. Perhaps. All right. Yeah. Despite all of this masochism and uh, love for variance and losing and so forth, games are art, right? I mean, it is. It, how yeah, should, or, how listen, should we societally change our view? The. The word art is so overloaded. No, that let's go I, there. Yeah, let's just it's just like it. it's a it's a it's a something similar to an art form in the same sense that you know pop music is is, uh, is an art is an art form. Uh, it's a creative form. It's an expressive aesthetic form in that sense. Um, I I mean I think I don't think you can dictate to culture how culture should interpret things. I think culture is so complicated and nebulous this process i try to contribute in my work as as a as a teacher as a designer as a as someone who is out giving talks and stuff i do try to get people to be aware of what it is that people who love games what it is that they love because i think it, it can be confusing like if you're outside of the world of games looking in it can look like nonsense. It looks like <laughs> an explosion in a cartoon yeah. factory. Yeah. It's like, what is happening? This weird, violent junk that my kid is obsessed with. Um, and, and I do hope that I can um, help people who, who look at that understand, no, part of what your kid is doing is deep problem solving. Uh, part of what your kid is doing is exploring a complex system and forming hypotheses and and trying to get better at part of what your what your kid is doing is developing discipline part of what they're doing is is social and collaborative um a big part and days, yeah, yeah and and so um that doesn't ex you know in, in some cases you know people's yeah some most kids play too many video games <laughs> you know they, they probably do you know? sure. and um and There's always but, a balance yeah but but understanding what is happening under the hood uh and and what is valuable about that um, I think is the is the first step toward developing kind of collectively uh, evolving into a more sophisticated audience, right? With the that that demands better games, right? That has a more uh, subtle and and uh, refined sense of taste for what makes a good game, 
and pushes the art form in the right direction. I was at a conference maybe 15 years ago, so just to put it in social context, but it was about science and drama and narrative. So it was mostly about scientists talking to writers and, and English professors. And some conversation was happening and I came up with the idea, I raised my hand and said, are we gonna think a few decades from now that the newest, most exciting form of story, storytelling is games? And everyone said, oh no, <laughs> that's, that's not stories. Because like stories, there's only one thing that happens. You can't have a story where you're not sure what's gonna happen next. I think maybe we know better now. Yeah, I think some of the most interesting stuff that's happening in games uh, is these new forms of storytelling. Uh, and both in a traditional sense where you just have great characters and, and kind of rich world building uh, kind of woven into, into to game experiences. Um, and also in, a, in the kind of avant-garde sense of exploring what, it, what a story is, like what a story can be. Uh, and new forms of, of narrative and new forms of storytelling. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a lot happening in that world that's really interesting. And for the audience, because maybe not everyone is calibrated here, compare the size of the video game industry to the size of the movie industry right now. It's bigger. I don't know. <laughs> this is a, it's contentious. Spend a lot more money on it's video contentious, games than on but but I think mo by most measures. It is basically the, the sort of biggest uh, pop cultural industry right now. Um, so when a game like Red Dead Redemption 2 comes out, um, it's not just the biggest game launch in history. It's the biggest kind of entertainment launch in history. Uh, so, yeah, in terms of overall scale as a, as a commercial industry, uh, it's, it's immense, which is, is great for me because um, as someone who is excited about the, the creative possibilities, um, I get to kind of like uh, tag along, right? I get to hijack um, this this rising tide, this commercial tide, uh, which is not my primary interest. I mean, I don't want to, I want to make games that make money. Yeah. I want people to buy my game, um, but I'm mostly interested in in the creative potential, right? Um, and so uh, it's it's good. It's a good, healthy, I think, mix, honestly. But the yeah. there's a difference with other forms of mass market entertainment in that there's some barrier to entry it's siloed a little bit like when a really big movie comes out everyone knows about it whether or not they go to see it whereas there's huge numbers of people who have no idea what you're talking about when you talk about red dead redemption yeah but i mean maybe less and less so over time like maybe that's just a generational thing and uh you know maybe Does those are every 20 year old know about red dead redemption i i think I think it's a pretty well understood okay. touchstone of culture. Yeah. As much as like, what's an equip? I guess the maybe Avengers. the Avengers. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's not as well known as that. Um, but it's partly because the Avengers lives or dies as spectacle. Yeah. Whereas Red Dead Redemption has a, a, a because it is an activity uh, and a, and a hobby almost. Um, lives and dies by a slightly different yeah. cultural logic. It's not just about imprinting itself as an image a and less and ephemeral. Heads. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it is about um, creating a, a place and a, and a space that draws people in. Um, and so maybe that's part of the difference. Right? And you've highlighted the the interplay of emotion and logic. I, I think is how you put yeah. it. Um, and there's certainly a way that a video game can be where it's purely pristinely logical, right? You're adding up numbers or, you know, getting the shortest path. And there's also a way a game can be, I shouldn't have said video, any game, right? Uh, where it's more experiential, more emotional, more about how you're feeling in the moment. And is it slightly overgeneralizing or is it okay to say there's a sweet spot where they're both engaging? You know, I don't think of it in terms of a, a sweet spot where you have these two things and they're in conflict. Instead, I think you have these, these two different mindsets, right? The the kind of logical, rational uh, mindset of, you know, this maybe reductionist and kind of, you know, uh, conscious problem solving. And then you have the mindset of this kind of emotional, intuitive, uh, imaginative, improvisational mindset that is more fluid and, and less kind of uh, logical and analytical. I don't think of those things as being opposed necessarily. I think they're kind of woven together in a game. Um, and so for an example, you take the game chess, uh, which in, in one sense is this kind of purely logical exercise of, of problem solving, analytical problem solving. And yet the chess itself is something like an art form. You know, you're doing this analytical problem solving because you find it beautiful. 
because you there is an emotional connection to it because you find it expressive and meaningful and beautiful in ways that you can't precisely articulate and so in a sense this 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 logical problem solving is embedded in in something that is entirely illogical right it's not it's not logical to devote your life to playing chess it's highly <laughs> illogical depends on what your motivations are right yeah, yeah but. but 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 we but we do it because we we find it beautiful and 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 we find it meaningful and 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 so these things i think are wrapped around each other it's more of a fractal fractal structure than it is a kind of a dialectical structure. certainly something even with chess or go there are styles of play right if you thought of it as a purely logical yes. expression of trying to win you might not think there should be styles what makes uh, magnuson uh uh, thorny in his play. I forget how they describe his play, right. but he's like, he's known as someone who is like stubborn and th- and all he's doing is solving a math problem. Yeah. But, but it shows you that even in the realm of solving math problems, there is nuance. There are deep kind of heuristics that we will never get to the bottom of, right? Um, even when problems are well-defined, the path that you take through solution space can be totally irreducible individualistic yeah and 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 an expression of who you are as a person i remember i was on a panel once with uh gary kasparov who i like i like to introduce him as the last human being who was the best chess player in the world right yeah (laughs) now it's computers who are the best but he said uh something i thought was very interesting because his personal style was very aggressive very Mm -hmm. fast and there were there was a conventional wisdom that that was not the right way to play. Yeah, and he said when the computers came along, they played that way. He felt very he felt redeemed. Yeah, right? he felt vindicated that way. You know, it's funny when when uh, professional chess players uh, talk about play, they often use concepts from poker. This is another thing I love about games is that when you go deep on any one system, you find these resonances, sure. right? And so they talk about um, there's a lot in professional chess. Uh, uh, tournament level chess play there's a lot of predicting what your opponent's going to do what openings are they going to bring um what things are going to work well against them you want to spend your time thinking about the right pathway yeah right? and yeah. you can also have bluffing in 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 chess right you can make a move and and like hope that your opponent <laughs> thinks it's a good move when in fact you don't know for sure whether it is or not but you're trying to kind of like yeah. uh, rattle them uh which i just i just love I, I love this mix between these we think we have these categories we think we know the difference between logic and emotion uh, but I think games highlight the ways in which these things bleed into each other. And I like the idea of having styles in these different kind of games. It's a different aspect of this fact that games help with self-discovery, right? Not yeah. just self-discipline, but self-expression, sort of figuring out who we are. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think um, any game that you play is an opportunity to to learn something about yourself, an opportunity to to, to be on this... Uh, this path of self improvement, self overcoming, you know what I mean? Like this, this path that I personally want to be on as, as a human where I'm, where I'm not just good at what I'm doing, but I'm kind of improving my idea of what good means. Like what, what, what type of person am I trying to be, you know? And I think games give you an opportunity to do that. You don't have to do and Most games are not sure. like that. Most That's people okay. who play games aren't doing that. <laughs> Many people Battle who play Royale games, really they're just gonna... wasting their time yeah. and, and they're just disappearing into a, you know, a, a, ple- a pleasant experience. And that's great, you know. Um, but I think along the way, there's always this potential. And it's, that's what gets me excited. If we think about the history of game design, are we getting better at connecting with the sublime in our games? Is that something that is valued in the community? I, I think we are. I, I think I think we are getting better and better, um, which is not to say that it's like a, a simple, straightforward path, to, you know, that over time we just get better at. Yeah. Um, instead, it's this weird, circuitous Work thing, like it. all forms of culture. Um, are we getting better at music? I, I, you know, sort of, you know. Um, <laughs> and yet there are ancient pieces of music that I find deeply uh, uh, moving. Um, and so I think games are similar um, as, as a as a design discipline, I do think we are developing uh, new methods and and better kinds of uh, uh, best practices and and a sense of, of uh, how to do this really difficult, challenging task uh, slightly better. Um, but uh, it is it is irreducible. You yeah. Know? yeah. I mean, one aspect of the self discovery is given that there are definitely there's an aspect of being addicted or being in a zone and losing yourself. There's another aspect of games that let you become more conscious of processes that were unconscious, right? Yeah. You had that wonderful example of a game where you tried to just walk 
with oh, four keys yes. on the keyboard, Quack. and you realize that walking is yeah. really hard yes. if you have to tell your legs what to do. Yeah, this uh, wonderful game by by a, a close friend of mine, Bennett Foddy, who also teaches at NYU. Um, yeah, Quack, which is just a game where you're walking, <laughs> and uh, and, <laughs> Harder than uh, it and it's hilarious because it, it it what he did was this create this this incredibly. Uh, convoluted control scheme uh, where you control like different limbs and and your and um and so it turns this this trivial thing into this deeply complicated thing but you can get good at it uh, I, I did not get good at it in yeah the 10 minutes that i spent give, give yourself time okay yeah. maybe i won't yeah. <laughs> so what do you think we should wrap up a little bit um two things you can ask answer which one first you sure. want one is um speculate crazily about the future of gaming i mean will it become a bigger and bigger entertainment behemoth or will it sort of blur into the cultural milieu so that games are everywhere in, in some sense and the other is I, i'm sure we have a heterogeneous audience in terms of some people are avid gamers some people have never done it mm -hmm. for those who've never done it how should they approach games are there are there certain games they should think about playing oh, yeah. uh is there a, yeah. is there a what gateway drug i want to answer the second question. okay okay because the first question it's too hard to predict culture i mean the, no you the, have to answer both you can just oh i say, i can I'll, I'll, ordering i'll, I'll do the i'll do the first one first and i'll just <laughs> knock it out of the park Good. and then move on right. um it the job of a game designer is to answer that question right exactly. every game designer is trying to figure out what the future of games is and it is going to be and what it should be um and so in the process of making games we are actively uh, fulfilling that kind of role of predicting what the future of games is going to be. So that's my <laughs> short answer to Fine. that. Um, the the second question of what, yeah, a lot of times people come up to me and and you know what kind of game should I play? How do I get into this world? What I like to tell them is find a game that your friends are playing and play that. Like it's 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 so much it's so much more important that you play a game as part of a living community mm -hmm. than that you play the right game. Uh, play a game that other people are playing that you can then talk to them about it. Like you can learn from them. You can say, well, what did you like? What did I, you know, yeah. I didn't get very far. I'm stuck here. Or that you can play with them. Um, and, and sort of like think about the game as being part of a social practice where people communicate with each other uh, through the game. I think that's... I think that's more important than playing just the right kind of like little masterpiece that's going to like this whole idea yeah. of, of masterpieces. You know what I mean? Like like uh, we have a, a running joke in game design about Citizen Kane. You know, where, where's <laughs> the Citizen Kane, Kane, Kane of games? And and um, but I think games by their nature are so squirrely, right? They are so evanescent and 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 they're so weird that they don't fit into that little tidy box of what a masterpiece is, right? They don't fit into this, this thing where, oh yes, I can take an object and put it on a pedestal and look at it and see its characteristics and, and thereby get some aesthetic experience because they're participatory. And so, um, so it's less important that you play uh, Cinco Paus, the greatest game uh, that you can play right now. It's a, a game I love by uh, my uh, game designer named Michael Burrow. Um, it's more important that you play something that you have a context, a social context for, and that you can talk to people about and, and learn um, and, and be motivated to participate in. So, I mean, there's an introvert part of me inside that says, but I just want to ignore other people when I'm playing games. But then I remember that, you know, a really good poker table really matters. The other people you're playing with is a huge part of yeah, the experience. It's really yeah. true. I often think if I were in a place and, and I was given an option, I was with a bunch of people and I was given an option, you can go into room A and play this game that you know is a great game, but play it with these people were maybe a bunch of jerks or you go in this other room and play a game that maybe yeah. is not so good in its own but with these wonderful people that you love and you think are really interesting and clever right. it's always better to do the second thing there's a lot to think about about the future of this i think that we're just starting really with uh where games can go so frank lance thanks so much for being on the podcast thank you loving and santa fe and the interplanetary festival thanks so much for having us and thank you very much to the audience for helping us with this experience. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks.